more and more people is recognizing that privacy is very important. But how to protect our personal data and uh, uh, and uh, protect our uh, privacy security? Here's a solution in Polkadot ecosystem that is uh, Mental Network. And uh, Manta is enabling on-chain privacy by using their knowledge proof. It brings privacy to DeFi, NFT, DAOs, and more. And Manta has launched its testnet version 2 and uh, OpenZL. Uh, so I'm very happy today to invite the, their co-founder, Kenny, here to dive deeper into the critical roles uh, privacy place for the Web3. Welcome, Kenny. Thanks for having me here. Appreciate <laughs> it. Before we start, uh, could you please brief us on the background of yourself, your founding team, Manta, and uh, such as what is Manta? And uh, also the, the name Manta intrigued me a lot. So what, uh, is there a story behind it? Yeah, sure. So, um... Just a, a little brief background on myself. Uh, I, I guess you can consider me more like an entrepreneur. I've been working in the tech space for about a decade now. Started my first company in cloud computing. That got me into Bitcoin mining. And from there, I just kind of fell down the rabbit hole and started learning more about crypto, blockchain, decentralization, and the implications of like this new sort of technology and what it means for the world, not just you know currently, but 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Um, and as part of that, you know, I did a few projects back in uh, 2015 and did a bit of content writing as well. So kind of tried to build some thought leadership around the space in the early days. In 2018, I went to go pursue my MBA at MIT, and that's where I met uh, my co-founders. So I was the teaching assistant for all the blockchain courses uh, at the business school, and that was taught under Gary Gensler, who is now the chairman of the SEC. And during that time, uh, one of my co-founders, Victor, he was studying for his master's in economics at Harvard, and he had cross-registered for some courses over at MIT, specifically the blockchain courses. And so that's how we met. I was you know, the teaching assistant for those classes. And at the same time, Shu Mo, he's our technical co-founder, he was working at Algorand at the time. And so Algorand is a spin-out created by Silvio Macaulay, a world-renowned cryptography professor from MIT. And so that was also in the same area. And so we all met in the crypto space around Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, so that's a little background on myself, the team. And I guess the second part of your question was specifically around like, why are we called Manta Network? And so um, so a manta ray, right? I, for, for those of you that don't know, right? They're very large creatures uh, and they are they have a natural camouflage. They have a very dark skin on the top and a very light skin on the bottom. And so that protects them because when you look from the top down into the ocean, the dark ocean, you just see darkness and the dark skin on top camouflages them to the bottom of the ocean. Simultaneously, if you look from the bottom up, then you see the sunlight and it's very light, but also the, the lighter belly area of the manta ray camouflages it from the bottom up. And so because the creature is very large, all the animals swimming above or below it you don't see because they're protected by, you know, the camouflage of the manta ray. So that's sort of uh, the, the privacy theme that we're going for in the sense that, you know, we want to be um, there, but also not very imposing. Mm -hmm. Very interesting story. So here comes our first topic. Why is privacy so important to Web3? How does it impact our day-to-day -day interactions? Could you add some uh, flesh to the bones uh, by picturing some typical scenarios for us. Yeah, so um, I'd like to think about this in three parts. The first part is the, the illusion that privacy is only useful for doing bad things, right? Um, I want to make sure that, you know, as we continue this conversation, that we don't just think of it from that framework, because it's the same sort of framework that Bitcoin had years ago. Back in 2008, when it first started, right, it's created through a cypherpunk community. It's, you know, people who say, oh, you're, you're using Bitcoin because you want to do bad things. You want to buy drugs on the internet or something like that, right? What else would you use Bitcoin for? And then fast forward to 2022, now you see institutional funds all getting into Bitcoin as part of their investment strategy, right? And so like Bitcoin has transformed through this, through these years, uh, to become a lot more legitimate and a lot more widely adopted. I think the same conversation needs to be had about privacy because now 
the same conversations about privacy are around, oh, you only need on-chain privacy if you're buying drugs or doing something illegal. But that's not true, uh, especially as we think about blockchain five to 10 years from now, as use cases continue to expand, um, you need privacy more than ever because privacy is one of those things where you can't take it back, especially not with blockchain because everything on the blockchain is immutable, meaning that once it's written to the blockchain, you can't hit delete. You can't redo it, right? It's already there and it's going to be there forever. And so there are a lot of implications there, but that's, that's the first part. So the first part is, you know, we need to dispel the illusion that privacy is only for bad people. It's for everyone. It's a fundamental human right. The second part of that answer is specifically focused on the, I guess, the human rights aspect, which is the individual users and thinking about how on-chain privacy is necessary for scaling Web3 to a billion or 3 billion people, uh, 5 7 billion, I mean, the world, <laughs> right? Um, it's extremely critical because every single piece of data that is written on chain is permanent. And so that becomes data that anyone can use against you without your consent. And so you're not just thinking about like, oh, what does your government think about you? But what is your government's enemies collect on you? What sort of data can they get on you? Uh, what can companies that you don't want to have your data get on you, right? There's all this unauthorized access to data now um, and so we need to take back that control. And so on an individual level, there's a lot of implications on the importance of privacy. And then finally, the third part is the application level. So there's a lot of implications on use cases and applications that can't exist without privacy. I think one of the biggest um, problems today with on-chain governance is the fact that everything is public. Uh, I'm not saying that everything needs to be private, private, but the optionality definitely has to be there. And so what I mean by that is essentially, you know, when you look at on-chain governance statistics, about 0.2 to 1% if, you're, if, you're got a, if you have a, an amazing community, right? Like maybe 1% of token holders, or not token holders, but tokens are used for like votes for on-chain governance. And so we already see that there's a very small amount of people or, you know, uh, tokens being used for actual on-chain governance as a utility. But the implications of the votes themselves are, um, are I guess, complicated. And so what I mean by that is essentially people make different voting behaviors based on whether or not they understand that other people can see what they vote for. If I know that you can see me voting against something and the whole community is voting for it, then I'm less inclined to either vote at all or maybe I'll vote for it too just to show people that I'm with the community, right? And so there's a lot of outside pressure um, that can sway or distort votes in the true public opinion if it's all public. And so having some layer of privacy for on-chain governance, I think, creates a much more fair democratic environment for people to actually express their true opinions as part of the community. And that's just one use case. There's a lot of different use cases that I think either one are broken or two don't exist because of a lack of privacy. So just to summarize, right, three things. One is um, we need to elevate the conversation around privacy and really understand the problems beyond just like, you know, using it for bad things. Two is it has a lot of effects on uh, fundamental human rights on chain. And three is we can't really scale out and build new use cases or even build correct use cases uh, without privacy. Yes, these are very typical scenarios. Uh, our next topic is the early stage of blockchain, which we find ourselves we still find ourselves in is, is fraught with pressing issues like a high gas fee, network congestion, and uh, inconvenient isolation. Privacy, on the other hand, despite its widely acknowledged importance, is still take is still treated as a second priority. Why is that? Yeah. So um, why is it treated as a second priority? I think it's ultimately it boils down to uh, user habits. And so right now we're in a transition phase for Web3, right? Because everyone is still using Web2 applications and we can probably continue to use Web2 applications for the next decade or even more. Um, but it's not just a transition of applications to Web3, it's also a transition of user habits and user behavior to Web3. And so, you know, to, to really wonder or to really ask why privacy is taking a back seat to other priorities, you have to look at what the user habits of Web2 are like. And in Web2, it's very um, non-private, right? We have 
we have things like, you know, you sign up for a website or a service and it gives you a whole list of terms and conditions. Most of us are inclined to not even read through all the terms and conditions. We just hit, I agree, and then go in, right? Because hitting, I agree means I only have to spend two seconds versus reading the terms and conditions. It's 10 minutes. And the thing is, you know, I've done it before and it's fine. So I'll do it again. And so you repeat the process and it becomes kind of user habit to not care so much about your own privacy. Um, also, the other issue is um, with Web2, users are used to the idea that their data is safe, despite the fact that, you know, every now and then there's hacks and stuff. But ultimately, right, like we trust centralized entities to protect our data, whether it's Facebook or Google or Baidu or others, right? Like, um, and so it becomes a really, but what we see is it becomes a really big problem when these trusted centralized entities somehow leak our data, whether intentionally or un unintentionally. Facebook, the, the, the case study for Cambridge Analytica, right? I mean, we've got tons of user data on Facebook. And then once we realize that Cambridge Analytica has been siphoning that data for their own purposes against the individual consent, then, you know, nations, the, the European Union brings up cases, right? Like the United States citizens are very upset. It's, um, I think, we are concerned about our privacy, but we assume that our privacy is already protected by default on the internet. And so that's a very web two concept. But the thing is we've lived in the web two space for like 99% of the internet. And now we're finally moving over to web three. And so we bring those user habits into web three. And so one of the user habits is, oh, my privacy is fine. I don't need to care about it because I never needed to care about it before, right? And so like what we need to do in this web three space is you know, from a privacy perspective, people definitely need to understand that privacy is a very different game in Web3. There's no one protecting your data. Literally everything you do is fully on chain. You go buy a coffee at a Starbucks downstairs and I can see that every single day at 8 a.m. you go to the same Starbucks and you buy the same coffee. What does that imply, right? I mean, like it can be good or it can be bad. Um, but yeah, so ultimately I think it just boils down to user habits uh, and that's why privacy has taken a backseat, but it doesn't imply that privacy isn't important. Yes, it it is really important. Now let's talk about the critical roles that privacy play in the future of Web3. Uh, as a layer sure. one, uh, what should be done to unite all sort of economic drivers and bring them to, to the ecosystem? Yeah, so, um, you know, when you think about economic drivers, you think about, well, I guess, you know, it boils down to money money and market size and that uh, that trickles down into a lot of other things right like variables such as the user base growing the number of users should correlate with the growth of revenue which you know goes into economic drivers so growing the number of users means that you also have to grow the number of applications uh the the the, the, the use cases and so it kind of goes back to my explanation of you know without privacy uh, you can't really enable those types of use cases on chain and so with privacy um, being able to enable those use cases, you then drive a larger audience and then that audience thereby generates more revenue. And so I think, you know, one of the main economic drivers is, you know, generating uh, new use cases for the ecosystem beyond what we see today, which is mainly just DeFi and NFTs. Um, the other one is user experience. And so what I mean by that is we're all intimidated by wallet addresses. I don't know how often you transact on chain, but like I've done it many, many times. I don't even know if it's in, in the thousands or tens of thousands of times, but uh, I'm still intimidated every single time I send a transaction because I'm always scared I send it to the wrong wallet address. I have to check and double check, right? And like that just is a poor user experience. And uh, it's the same goes with privacy. You can't, or we don't, at Manta, we don't believe that we can scale privacy if we create a poor user experience, which means that we have to think about not just building a technology, but also building it in the most fundamentally easy way for users to adopt. And so one of our philosophies is essentially making privacy a utility. What that means is, is we have to build privacy in a way where people don't have to think about it. So building it directly into applications, building it directly into wallet partners, right? And, and what some, some analogy to this would essentially be, you go to a restaurant, you order a water uh, and you get your water, right? But you don't know where the water came from. You don't care where the water came from. You just drink it and it's exactly what you need. And you know, we wanna be that same way with privacy. We don't need every single user to know necessarily that they're using Manta Network every single time. 
but whenever they need privacy, whenever they want to enable it, they can enable it immediately seamlessly and they just get it. And in the back end, Manta take care, takes care of all the rest. Yes, uh, user experience is very important. And the back to yeah. a, a technical topic, uh, zero knowledge proof is rising in popularity in the crypto world. It has the potential to enhance the scalability and improve uh, privacy protection. Uh, but what exactly is their knowledge proof? Why is it so special? How is meant leveraging it? Uh, could you answer the above questions in plain language so that our non-tech savvy audience could easily understand? Sure. So I'll answer the last part of the question first, um, just to kind of drive home to why it's important for a Manta network. We're specifically using zero knowledge proofs to create privacy for users. Uh, and the zero knowledge proofs that are created, sorry, um, are placed on chain. And so what that means is that when people look at on chain data, they don't see any information about you know, they don't see, uh, for example, who the who the sender is, or who the receiver is, or the token ID, which asset it is, or how much of the asset there is. They only see a zero knowledge proof. Um, what is a zero knowledge proof? In very layman's terms, a zero knowledge proof is uh, a methodology for proving that you own something, or that you did something, or et cetera, et cetera, right? Like something about you, proving something about yourself without revealing any of the information about yourself. So one analogy that I've been giving uh, is a driver's license. And a driver's license, you can think of as a zero knowledge proof that you can drive. A driver's license isn't a perfect example because when you look at a driver's license, you see my name and my age and my other information. But imagine this is a driver's license that doesn't have any of that information. It's just some sort of plastic card that's just black. And if I show you this plastic card, you know I can drive, right? So if you ask me, hey, Kenny, are you able to drive? Well, I don't have to ask you to jump in my car and show you that I can drive, right? To prove that I can drive. I can just show you this, this card. And this card is proof that I can drive because it's, you know, yeah. Um, and so how is the zero knowledge proof generated? It's uh, very, I, I think like one classic example of generating zero knowledge proof is using uh, the idea of a color blindness test. And so how that works is, you have, you want to, or I want to prove to you that I'm not colorblind. And so you have two balls in your hand, one's red and one's blue. You put the balls behind you and you shuffle them and you ask me to pick the red ball. So you bring them out and I pick the red ball correctly. And you say, okay, well, that's a lucky guess because we only did it one time. And so let's do it again. We do it again, uh, I guess again. And you're like, okay, this person's just extremely lucky. And so we do it a thousand times. And then by that time you're like, okay, this probably isn't just luck. It's probably more statistically probable that this person actually isn't colorblind, right? And so essentially by, by playing the game over and over again, I've generated or I've proven to you that I'm not colorblind without you having to inspect my eyeballs for all the like, you know, color cells. Um, that's, that's not scientific at all. But uh, yes, yeah, so that's, that's essentially how a zero knowledge proof is generated. Uh, the driver's license example is how a zero knowledge proof works. Uh, and you know, Manta specific leverage, specifically leverages it for privacy. The vision of Manta is to become uh, the privacy layer of Web3 using their knowledge proof. This vision consists of uh, three steps, Manta Pay, Manta Swap, Manta Privacy Preserving Smart Contract. Could you walk us through <clears throat> one by one and help the audience get a grasp on the status in terms of uh, development and related plans? Yeah, so um, three things, right? Manta Pay, Manta Swap, and the privacy preserving smart contracts. We started off building Manta Pay because Manta Pay, despite being a product, um, is fundamental to exactly what we're building out for privacy. And so we needed to get this thing done first. And so Manta Pay, you can think of it like Zcash, but instead of using one specific cryptocurrency, like on Zcash, you only use Zcash. On Mantapay, you're able to transact with any cryptocurrency. And so that's part of our effort to uh, not only build the foundational layers for building other technologies on Manta Network, but also to bring a better user experience for private transacting, where if I wanted to send you 10 DOT, for example, I don't have to convert the 10 DOT into Zcash and then send you Zcash and then you reconvert it back into DOT. I can just send you 10 DOT directly and you can keep that DOT fully private within our ecosystem. And so that, that's kind of like a, 
two-step approach. One is bringing a better user experience for privacy to Polkadot. Um, two is specifically building out the technology for the foundations of the other things that we're building out. And so what are the other things that we're building out? Two things, uh, specifically around Mantis Swap, uh, one of the things that we're doing right now first is the private smart contract system. And I can't get into too much detail about this because we haven't made too many announcements about it, but we've been working on this for the past uh, half year and uh, we're pretty close to launch, so stay tuned for more announcements. But the, smart, the private smart contract system will allow users to, or allow an ecosystem to thrive on top of Manta Network, where applications can deploy and leverage um, our privacy-preserving technology. And so from there, what we're doing is we're building Manta Swap, which is our DEX layer, directly on top of the privacy-preserving smart contracts. Okay. Great. Uh, Manta has recently launched the OpenZL. Uh, what is Manta OpenZL? Why is it so important? Yeah, great, great. Um, let me check to see if my AirPods are doing okay. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect, great. <laughs> it's a wonderful technology, you know, it just charges so quickly. Uh -huh. This is great yeah. user experience. Hopefully we can do something similar for Manta. Yeah. Um, so what is OpenZL? So OpenZL, ZL is short for ZK Lib, uh, and Lib is short for library. So we're creating an open standard for uh, zero knowledge proofs, um, or we're creating a library for zero knowledge proofs. And what are we doing? Why are we doing this? So traditionally, zero knowledge proofs are very hard to uh, implement. It's especially in an optimal way. You can you can you know implement a library and it can run and it can take like a minute to generate a zero knowledge proof. But if you want to boil it down to like a, a zero knowledge proof to be generated in two to five seconds, you really need expertise. You need a cryptographer. And not every project wants a cryptographer, uh, but they want to potentially use zero knowledge proofs in their applications uh, in a very generalized manner. And so the OpenZL is specifically designed for that. So if you are a developer and you want to leverage zero knowledge proofs in your application, but you don't have a, a cryptographer in hand, uh, you don't have to either hire a cryptographer or just not implement it because it's too complicated. You can use OpenZL, which is supposed to abstract away all the complexity of zero knowledge proofs and still allow everyday developers to use and integrate into their applications easily. So that's that's what OpenZL is. It is an initiative that we're working on with a lot of other projects like Filecoin, um, and it just started. So you know, there's a lot of developments that I think we'll be making in the next upcoming quarters. Mm, amazing, and uh, Mentor Signer is a secret manager and a zero knowledge proof generator for use with Mentor Network. Why do you need a Why do you need a signer? What is the difference between Signer and Polkadot.js Talisman Wallet? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And we need to distinguish between the purpose of the Signer and the purpose of the wallet. So right now, what we're doing is we are trying to optimize for the performance side. And so that means that we're able to create a zero knowledge proof for the user in a manner of two to five seconds, which is amazing because then the user experience is much better. Because if we create a zero knowledge proof in two to five seconds, and then that proof can be written to the blockchain in like 10 to 15 seconds, then overall the latency is like 30 seconds for the user. And so uh, that's a great user experience. And the way that we achieve that zero knowledge proof generation of two to five seconds is through the Manta signer. So the Manta signer is a desktop application that generates your zero knowledge proof. Once that zero knowledge proof is generated, then you use a wallet like Polkadot.js or Talisman or SubWallet to write that uh, zero knowledge proof to the blockchain, to our blockchain specifically. Um, in the future, we are uh, work, we're, well, we're currently working on abstracting away the Manta signer in the future so that it can be directly integrated into wallets. And so that means that the user doesn't have to download any signers anymore. And so, you know, the challenge here for us is to make sure that we can get that same user experience in terms of speed without having to use the signer. And so there's still a lot more optimization that we're doing internally before we take away the signer. But I think we're, we're pretty close to that. Okay, great. And finally, is there anything you would like to add regarding the future plans, Manta or Web3 Extra? Yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of future plans for Manta. In fact, yeah, I kind of alluded to some today in our conversation. 
that I couldn't get into too much detail about because we haven't really made any public announcements yet. But I'll just say that that's just the tip of the iceberg. We have a lot of things in development that will be the first of its kind. And so as I would, I would really consider Nanta Network as innovators in the privacy space for Web3. And a lot, of the, a lot of the new technologies, the products that we'll be releasing in the next few quarters will really prove that. Um, I think our team is definitely talented and positioned in the best way possible to, to push our products forward very quickly. Uh, and so we just have to be sensitive about it from like a, a business and strategic perspective in terms of like the announcements and what we can talk about. Um, so, so I just want to be respectful of that, but there's definitely going to be a lot of developments. Um, and so I would encourage anyone who's interested to stay tuned with us on our Twitter channel, uh, which is just uh, at Manta Network or our Telegram channel, which is at Manta Network Official. And we also have WeChat groups and we also have uh, Discord. Okay. Um, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, we are a, a incredibly uh, excited that Manta is building the future of privacy for the world and may everything a uh, great success. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks mm -hmm. for the time. Okay. Bye.